Thanks very much for coming in here. Um, if you want to come closer, you can, but I suppose this, uh, you're able to pick it up with this. Um, it's a strange thing to be putting poetry uh, with coaching in sport or any of those activities which seem not to have anything to do with poetry um, or with the literary life. But in fact, there is a kind of a dream, I think, at the heart of both those who participate in sport and those who begin to write. And that is a kind of dream of fame. And I think fame is a very, very difficult thing to uh, define. It is not necessarily notoriety. It is really the promise that people beyond your personal relationship would be talking about you. As they say about the paranoid Irish poet, a paranoid Irish poet is one who thinks nobody's talking about him. And that's a very important way of understanding the psychology of what fame is. It's an understanding that there is a view of your life and of what you're doing, which is actually beyond your own description of it. In other words, other people have intervened from stories they've heard about you and from your work they've seen in the case of sport on the field, in the case of poetry on the page, from your work, they have actually deduced opinions about you that have nothing to do with you personally. But in fact, they are part of the broad, if you like, range of gossip, a kind of paradigm of publicity within which you must work as a writer or which you must work indeed as a coach. So, you know, um, how it works is very psychological. It's very um, personal and it's also very chauvinistic. I'll always remember a few years ago standing at the uh, desk of Cork City Library where I worked. Um, I, I was uh, just standing there on a very busy Monday morning at the end of September, which anybody involved in sport will know is a terrible time when there are only a few winners running around the country. Um, this Cork man, of course, comes in, myself being a Waterford man, and he says, Tom, it's great to see you. How are you? I haven't seen you for ages. How are things? I said, great. He said, you're the man, he said. Now, I always wanted to ask you this question, he said. Why do they call da Waterford people Dacia people? Why are they called Dacia people? I said, well... I said there was a tribe called the Daces, the Dacia, and in fact the Dalgash ran them out of Waterford originally and they ended up in the, the middle of the country, which is why you get names like Whelan and Phelan in County Offaly and places like that. I said, so they were an ancient tribe. Not at all, says he. Not at all, Tom. That's not it at all. I'll tell you why their Waterford people are called Dacia. Because at the end of the championship every year, you meet a Waterford man and he says, they should have won this, they should have won that. He said, that's why you're called the Dacia. I thought to myself, I'll either hit this man or laugh. Um, but as I was outnumbered by Corkman in the city of Cork, I chose to remain silent. Good luck, Tom, says he's great to see you. Great talking to you. Um, the interesting thing was that his story about Waterford was part of the great anecdotal life of Cork fame. Cork being the great kind of dominant county, if you like, although sometimes Limerick and nearly always Tipperary would argue with you if you said that, but Cork being the dominant sporting county and the largest, of course, of Munster, creates a whole series of myths around its own teams, which are both part of history, part of anecdote, part of gossip, but they're always belonging to the paradigm of storytelling, which is really the fame for Cork people of how good Cork is. It's very interesting for me as a Waterford man who has lived in Cork um, to see how that occurs. It's psychologically very interesting. So what, in a way, can a county that probably remembers itself most uh, for reaching finals rather than going away with the cup what does a county or a team do in that case? 
What does a coach do? What does a county chairman do? And this is what they do. The Capuquin, which is where I am from in County Waterford, the Capuquin Hurling and Football Club produced a phenomenal number of fine underage players, particularly hurlers in the post-war years. Three county minor finals were contested and lost to Mount Sion in 1945-47, the closest match being 45 when Thomas Lonergan inspired Capuquin went down by three points, having led by five at one point and fielding without Jim Sargent, who had been refused leave from Mount Mellory Abbey School. Another minor hurling final was lost in 54. Ironically, the club's only minor success in these years came in football when Billy Conway was scorer-in-chief against Mount Sion in 1947. Yet undoubtedly, the greatest achievement by Capuquin Young Hurlers came with a county in 1948 when they backboned the Waterford minor hurling team to win the All-Ireland final. The efforts of the six Capuquin lads who played, Joe Flynn, Michael Keller, Vincent Walsh, Michael Brown, Billy Conway and Michael O'Connor, combined with the coaching role of Paddy Cunningham to the team, earned them the title locally and far beyond as the Magnificent Seven. At adult level, Capuquin again won the county junior hurling title in '48. As seniors in the 1950s, Capuquin emerged as one of the finest hurling teams in the county. The county title remained elusive, however, with the club's only final appearance in September 1956, ending in defeat once again to Mount Sion. The greatest success was at senior level, and that was in 57, when Capuquin outscored Mount Sion by 4-9 to 3-6. The number of Capuquin hurlers who played for the Waterford seniors in the 1950s alone runs into double figures at a time when city clubs held a monopoly. Michael O'Connor was not only a regular member of a Waterford team for close on a decade, but in 57 achieved a unique treble of winning a Railway Cup medal with Munster and All-Ireland runners-up medal with Waterford and playing on the Waterford senior football team that sensationally beat Kerry in the championship. That's, I'm reading from a local history of Capuquin. And this is a book which, if you're old enough, you would probably remember. It's The Big Sycamore by Joseph Brady, a very famous book in its day in the early 60s, which told the story of a little town and its one-armed headmaster. When Mullinet Lock was at the pinnacle of its glory on the football field, its 17 famous players were Mike Lyons, Dan Maher, Jim Burke, Michael Key Kearns, the brothers Tom, Jim and Mike Cooney. So you get the full list of all the names. Tom Kiley, also part of the team, was one of Ireland's greatest athletes. On the 10th of September 1892 at Jones Road, he won seven GA championships, championships, the 16 pound shot, the long jump, the 120 yards hurdles, the hammer throw, putting the seven and 18 pound and a hop, step and jump, a total never equaled by any athlete. He competed in four Irish All-Ireland Championships and won all. He won 71 gold medals in home and international contests. He completed in the American, competed in the American decathlon in 1904 and 1906 and was declared all-round champion on both occasions. At that time, the GAA had no sports star of the week as featured in the press. Fame was almost always confined to the boundary of a parish. When Matt the Thrasher, in the novel, looked down on the thatched cabins of Knocknagow and threw the hammer far beyond a point that marked Captain French's throw, Matt was thinking only of the credit of his own little village. He was inspired to hu superhuman efforts by that single blow that someone struck, as if by accident, on a big drum in Knocknagow's band. So what he was playing for was the response of fame that he understood, which was to be remembered in the noise of a drumbeat of victory 
in his home village. That was, for him, the meaning of fame. It wasn't an All-Ireland title, but it was fame of a localised manner. And this is how, I think, poets especially always compete. Um, they develop early on in isolation. They don't have teamwork like you would have in sport. They develop a kind of paradigm of the future for themselves, where they invent their own future readership. As I think, in a sense, at the beginning of any kind of sporting enterprise, you must invent a view of the future. You cannot do anything worthwhile unless the people doing it with you have a view of the future. So the view of the future, in a sense, can be learned. You can teach people to view the future and by arranging the incidents. If you think of the word, if you think of the word myth, what is myth? Myth, the Greek word, as Aristotle called it, means the arrangement of the incidents. So you need to arrange great and heroic incidents and characters from the past. And out of that selection process, which is an imaginative thing, you actually craft a view of how successful you're going to be in the future. That's how you imagine a success in order to lead. One of the greatest, I think, um, and most appalling sort of developments really in the last 10 years, especially in Ireland, but really almost across the Anglo-Saxon world as well as Ireland, is the notion that sort of you can do a survey of what the present looks like. And then from that survey, you can actually present people with a view of the future. That's not how you give people a view of the future. They already understand fully what's in the present. But leadership consists of being able to go farther than people might imagine, of being able to give people a view of that future. I'll always remember Rudy Giuliani's fantastic story about the day that M Martin Luther King was assassinated. I don't know if you know that story. Um, Robert Kennedy arrived in Cincinnati and he was told by one of his aides that Martin Luther King was dead. Now the crowd all around the plane where he landed in Cincinnati were all cheering for Kennedy and with placards and things. They didn't yet know. Many of them were black, African-American enthusiasts for the Democratic Party and for the Kennedys. And so what do you do in that situation? Kennedy told people to be silent, that he had something important to tell them. And he said to them, Martin Luther King has been killed by a white man, just as my brother was killed by a white man. He said, I want you all to go and into all of the suburbs and the housing projects of Cincinnati. And you, white people on the staff, go and explain to the black people why a white man shot Martin Luther King. And they all said, first of all, they were horrified. And they said, how are we going to do that? What are we going to say? He said, it's not important what you say, but they must see you struggling to explain it. Now, they did as Robert Kennedy asked them. And there was rioting in 47 American cities that night, but no riot in Cincinnati. So you have to be able to show with confidence you have to be able to invent a way of dealing with reality that, that pulls people out of their own fear zone and pulls them on to another arrangement of the future, which the future is as uncertain for you as it is for anybody you lead. But that arrangement of the future is something poets are always imagining. And poets get into constant trouble over imagining these unreal and romantic futures for themselves in their fame and for their countries and for their tribes, for the ear, as Seamus Heaney says, for what, is, for what is said behind backs for the people. I mean, there's a very, very good book by Michael Fitzgerald, Professor Michael Fitzgerald, an absolutely brilliant analysis, probably the best of its kind, of sort of artistic creativity. 
Now, Dr. Michael Fitzgerald is a brilliant uh, expert on Asperger's syndrome. So he would see the kind of creative tendencies which are in artists, the deliberate refusal to accept reality in order to just prolong a particular theme, whether it's a theme of Bogland, say in Seamus Heaney, or a theme of uh, rebellion, as you'd have in the poetry of W.B. Yeats, a refusal to sort of be reasonable. He would see that as a sort of uh, a way of, of, of sort of explaining what Asperger's syndrome is. And in, in a way, his, it is a terrific book. It's called The Genesis of Artistic Creativity. Asperger's Syndrome and the Arts by Michael Fitzgerald. It's a really worthwhile book to actually look at as he analyzes the behavior of poets like W.B. Yeats or writers like Lewis Carroll and shows how they were always struggling to be ordinary in a sense. They were always struggling to be reasonable, but they could not be reasonable. This was the problem. They always had precise messages to tell and they wouldn't be torn away from that precise message. And I feel myself that the precise message they had to tell as writers, as poets and writers, that was the message that, in terms of leadership and coaching, that's the message that you need to decide to tell a team or tell the person you're coaching. Because people can't on their own, particularly people who are young, whose imaginative powers are not yet fully developed. They can't be expected to have a view, a full view of the future for themselves. And I think just as it's part of the kind of function of literature, of poetry and art to give us views of the future, to tell us how the world might be as well as the way it is. So I think a coaching towards success is also an ability to invent a future for the team you coach. And that is, to me, almost this, exactly the same process as the making of poetry. Um, there, are, there are just so many um, interesting uh, things in terms of, of, of the psychology of this. You know, you, by le you lead by raising submerged feelings and sensations. You grow stronger by tapping into submerged feelings and sensations that are in particularly the young and by directing them towards a goal which in many ways is a future or paradigm that you invent for them. Like the effort to be successful comes out of necessity. But in fact, it's not completed only by necessity. It is only completed by an exceptional kind of dream by somebody holding on to a view of their future where they are at the top of their game. Now, people cannot develop that on their own. They need to be coached towards that view of life, I think. Um, what you do, in a way, is you protect those you coach from their failures by protecting the successful aspects of their personality and by reinforcing those aspects. And in many ways, that's the kind of organic nature of poetry as well. Um, the, I always think uh, there's a brilliant definition in, in Sigmund Freud in his dialogues about um, what is the purpose of your therapy? Um, why are you, why are you uh, do, should I be undergoing any kind of therapy? And Freud has an absolutely brilliant dialogue at the threshold of his psychoanalytical discoveries, Freud depicted an imaginary dialogue with a patient who protested. You tell me yourself that my illness is probably connected with my circumstances and the event in my life. How do you propose to help me then? To which Freud replied, you'll be able to convince yourself that much will be gained if we succeed in transforming your hysterical misery into common unhappiness. Now, I would say that a team at the end of any championship that doesn't hold the title is suffering, suffering from, once more, an appalling misery. And that the management towards a sort of moderate unhappiness about the result is probably something that takes months to do every year. 
But I'd say once that transition of accepting the unhappiness has actually occurred, then I think this is where your idea that you need to insert now a new view of the year, a new view of the future, by again selecting elements of success and presenting those elements of success as the general description of the year ahead. So you protect, in a sense, the wounded personality of your own team by giving your personality, by giving your team a, a view of the future which you have selected for them. Poets are always doing this. Um, there is a sort of other thing in poetry, which is the kind of obsessive striving after fame that poets have. But it's it's a striving after notice rather than a striving at, after intense publicity. The kind of fame that a poet has in general, unless they per- happen to win a Nobel Prize or become the subject of some terrible public scandal or whatever, the kind of fame that a poet or a writer is after, I think, is very horizontal. It is not so vertical and, and cannot always be seen from the present moment. It is really something that lasts for years beyond their work. And it's the slow accumulation of their work by a readership. The readership itself is where the fame lies. So that's why at the beginning I said to you, I read you these pieces from the Big Sycamore and a little piece from the local history of Capoquen. Because the fame we meant by Capoquen, for example, or by years of very, very sincere and brilliant but unsuccessful Waterford hurling, that fame is something which is now grown into the communal memory. And the memory itself holds those elements of fame that you can teach to the young. And I think it's crucial to remember that, that, that losing doesn't necessarily mean failure. Losing, in a sense, if you understand fame, means postponing the success that awaits a team. And the whole idea is to convince the team, I think, that that success does await them from available facts which are in the histories of teams. It's In a sense, it is what all poets do, which is, I think, one of the great elements of poetry, which is to resist the real while conferring unity upon it. In other words, resist all of the people who are telling you that this is no good, this writing is no good, this book is no good. You keep resisting those critiques in order to continue on because you have a belief. You actually refuse the reality of the critical response and you have the belief in the work you do. Um, in a way, as, as Dr. Fitzgerald would say, it's almost like a form of madness, um, a kind of socialised madness or a sense of being romantic. But this, in fact, capacity to resist the reality of failure, I think, is one of the key motivating, driving factors in the definition of a poet, the very name poet, uh, who contains aspects of the future. Um, Now and again, as I said, poetry coincides with the local. Poetry coincides not necessarily with the universal, but it can it can co- coincide with everything that's that's localized in a community, and so you end up in a way with poets in any community who are going to be uh, writing poems. For example, like this: "Come gather round me, boys, tonight, and raise your glasses high. Come Rockies, bars, and rover stars, let welcome hit the sky. Let bonfires blaze in heroes' praise. Let Shannon echoes fling." For homeward bound with hurling crown comes gallant Christy Ring. To every man his game and sport, as every man his creed. But where's the race that can compare with Cork's own hurling breed? As fair and free and fierce melee that ash and leather sling, and swift among the blades outflung moves peerless Christy Ring. Interestingly enough, that song for Christy Ring and it goes on for several more verses. It wasn't written by a Corkman at all. It was written by a Kerryman, Brian McMahon. But it shows how fame can impinge itself and influence others. So that the person 
at the lending desk of the library who said to me at the beginning, who said, do you know where the word Deisha comes from? In fact, that person is actually as the name of Christa Ring had impinged itself into the imagination of Brian McMahon, a carry man. That person was also sort of leaning on, if you like, the failures of a Deisha in, 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 in trying to interiorize that sense of failure in order to interiorize the, the kind of participation in success which being a Cork man meant for him. So I could go on in this kind of general way about poetry and about fame. Fame is not an illusion. The important thing to remember is it is not, fame is not an illusion. Um, and persons who surround young people, especially who are driving themselves to be high performance at sport, people who say to them, that's a foolish dream. I feel they're the most da- among the most dangerous people imaginable. Um, that usually comes from persons who have, in a way, interiorized their own sense of failure in their lives. Um, I would have no time for that and consider it hearsay and gossip. And I would tell my young charges to take no notice of such lack of success in people's view of the future. The important thing is to have that view of the future, as poets teach us. A future that is actually gathered or selected from elements of success in the past and projected as a goal two or three years hence. And that is enough to drive you to have a view just two years ahead. Not necessarily one year, but two years. Because a view two years ahead will always give you success the year before it. And that's such an important kind of psychological thing. But I think thinking about it uh, over the years, um, there are many, many books on how to write, as there are many, many books on sport. I mean, the shelves of our bookshops and our libraries are full of books on sport and actually on writing. Um, One of the best books I have ever read on writing was written by the English writer Vera Britton, the famous pacifist who wrote that incredible book about the First World War called Testament of Youth. Um, Vera Britton, she was the mother actually of uh, a future British British Minister, I remember, Shirley Williams, who I heard her being interviewed a few summers ago on Irish, on the radio, um, and she, she was as trenchant as her mother, as, as uncompromising as her mother. Um, I remember her being asked about Ed Miliband, and she said, he'll never be Prime Minister. Won't happen. And I remember Sean O'Rourke, I think it was Sean O'Rourke, saying, why do you say that? She says, it won't happen. It doesn't look like one. Um, and it was so true, it just didn't happen. Um, and which is of you say is totally unfair. Um, the psychology of fame as well is exactly the same for a poet as it is for an athlete. And the psychology of fame is something you carry within you, but it also carries you. Now, the most sometimes we can see how it operates when we see a catastrophe. And I think in recent sporting years, possibly the greatest catastrophe would be the story of Tiger Woods. It is really interesting to see the collapse of Tiger Woods psychologically. Uh, It's just not, it, it really can't be explained by physical attributes or troubles or medical troubles or whatever. But it's as if a whole psychology of the person was shattered by a single disastrous event and undermined the sense of the whole personality out of which we all achieve things. We all achieve things in the fullness of ourselves, not in a bit of ourselves. And that is absolutely true of poetry, of making poetry. It is out of the fullness of the self that poets, poems come. And so I think the incredible skill, say, of somebody like Christy Ring, or indeed somebody magnificent like John Mullane, that is out of the fullness of that character. It's not one aspect of the character. It's everything firing and blazing at one time. 
that gives them that extra 5% that will get a ball over the line or between the bars. So it is the fullness of character that you need to develop when training people, I think. And all the storytelling of the club, all the storytelling, as I read to you earlier, all the storytelling around villages, around village life, around local characters, that is all part of the building, the construction of a three-dimensional character. And that three-dimensional character will be the athlete who produces the extra five, even 10%, because you don't need people to be athletes 24-7. You need them to be athletes at the moment that the need is greatest, when they're actually needed to perform. So it is out of the fullness of themselves which they carry in their daily lives that that other attribute has a space to leap out of them. And I suppose that's what the great kind of coaching or the great teaching in poetry is all about, to preserve the personality. I'll always remember listening to Douglas de Hida's um, housekeeper. She was being interviewed once. And um, she said that when Mr. De Valera phoned Douglas de Hida and asked him would he become the first Uchtaran, the heron under the new constitution, that... Douglas Hyde took the phone call from De Valera and she said, he said he agreed, he agreed to be president of Ireland, but only on one condition, that it wouldn't interfere with his golf. <laughs> now, you said to yourself, that can't be true. I mean, a great intellectual like Douglas Deheda, an incredible poet in his own right, wonderful translator. Um, Actually, which reminds me, I'll just throw it out now because I can't avoid recommending books. Uh, Douglas Dehida has a wonderful diary of his travels in America in 1905, 1906, called Morusco America. Imasnoil Sni Lanur. An absolutely wonderful book. Very difficult to get copies of it now, so it's probably in the back stores of your local county libraries. But it is an absolutely wonderful book. But anyway, back to this question of golf. And Uchtaran the Heron. Of course, Douglas Hyde was an incredibly mild man. Uh, I mean, one of the main reasons why he left, uh, you know, the, the presidency of, of the Gaelic League of Conor and Gaelic, because he didn't really agree with the politicisation of, of Kultur and the Heron. And he stood aside. Without arguing with anybody, he just stood aside. That was his nature. Actually, somebody said of him that he was actually violent in his mildness. And the reason he wanted to preserve his golf, which is, if you like, what is a game of golf, except four hours walking pleasantly and slowly. He wanted to preserve that because that's when the ideas for translations and writing came to him. He was preserving the fullness of his literary self. He was going to do his national duty, but he understood absolutely what the fullness of his self meant. And he needed those blessed four hours for writing and going through things in his head as he went along, hitting the ball and putting. So things aren't always as they seem, but people who understand their own nature, and not only the limitations of their nature, but the full expanse of their nature, people learn instinctively how to protect that. And I would say one of the main functions, whether I'm doing a poetry workshop in Listowel or whether you'd be coaching your own teams, one of the main functions is to protect that fullness of personality in the young especially and let them grow within their own fullness um, by not excessively criticising aspects that are wrong but actually continuously emphasising aspects of their lives and of their work that's correct. Because they will get many critics, both locally and nationally, and they will encounter the other side of fame, which is failure in public, which is an amazing thing to ask any young person to do constantly. To be seen to fail in public is a huge burden on the young to fail to get that ball over the line, to fail to put that tackle in 
these are immense uh, traumas in the life of somebody very young. But if you can teach them something of the fullness of their own lives, I think, they won't be afraid of those moments of failure. In fact, they will learn how to file them into a narrative that's still a narrative with a successful view of the future. I think that's part of what teaching or coaching or workshopping is. Now, rather than go on indefinitely, I felt there are a few key things I should say to you. I mean, thinking about the making of poetry, and I've been writing poetry for 50, you know, 45 years and publishing it for 40 at least. Um, there are a number of important things to say which might be of some use to you that I have learned from writing and what you might take away in coaching or in leading because I'd always say coaching is leading. You can't avoid a leadership role if you're a coach. You can't say I'm just technically teaching them skills in this and skills in that, but actually the leader of the club is the chairman. They're looking to you to lead. You never must never be afraid to lead. It, it occurs in literature all the time in terms of people who are directors of, of poetry workshops and literary workshops. You know, the young writer will over-identify with you and put burdens on you to be leading them in a way to kind of, to be mentoring them all the time. I suppose that is part of the burden, but I would say it is one of the fullest joys of teaching, whether it's in poetry or in sport. But here, just um, to sum up what I've been saying, are a number of actions. Number one, and this is if you're a leader or a coach in any club or county situation especially, never, under any circumstances, write a public letter to the newspapers criticising somebody who has published a criticism of your method. It is one of the most catastrophic failures in authority that a coach or a writer can do. And it's one of the common uh, dangers that young writers um, happens to young poets. And it's sort of part of the tension of, of the writing community is that you cannot write a a sort of an honest negative critique of someone, of some young poet, because not only will they write a, a letter to the paper or the magazine attacking you for attacking them, but they will start a lifelong campaign against you for daring to criticise them. It's a total disaster to do that if you're in a leadership role. Every coach or every club should have a PRO who deals with these matters. And a PRO, of course, appointing a PRO is such a crucial thing. Your PRO should always be the calmest person, not the person who's always shouting. Um, it's really important because nothing undermines your authority than to start a public discussion about your methods with amateurs. Your method as a team leader, whether you're leading a poetry workshop or leading a team in sport, your method is private to you and the team, and you work out the limitations of it through the outcomes of the team and through responses from the team. You don't allow outsiders to become part of that conversation. I'll always remember Edmund Burke, the great statesman and his family, writing a letter to the uh, difficult and, 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 and violently argumentative Cork uh, painter James Barry, who was always fighting with everybody. And the Burke family raised enough money to send James Barry to Rome for six years to study his art, oil painting, under Italian masters. So they had a huge investment in his, his career and in his future. But Barry was fighting with everybody. And so the Burks wrote to him and they said, this was Edmund Burke's brother, Mr. Barry. I want you to be assured of our admiration for your genius and your excellence as an artist. But I wish to tell you that only your enemies are consoled when you lose your temper, never your friends. And I thought it was the most fantastic piece of advice. 
Your enemies love it when you lose your temper because they've got to you. They've broken down a discipline, your own self-discipline. And for young people under your charge, they should never see you losing your cool in public with a public representative or a, a journalist of any kind. Journalists, particularly sports journalists, are as entitled to their viewpoint as you are to yours. Now, they have the public forum and they can, it's all part of the great game of fame and the game of journalism, but they, they are entitled to their own errors of judgment. But they're not entitled to become part of the coaching team by you getting engaged in a public spat with them. It's really crucial. And so if I was to say anything, that is the one thing to learn from having been a re poetry reviewer and having had many books reviewed. Do not get involved in a public attack on somebody who has criticised you. And do not, under any circumstances, get involved in a lifelong campaign against that person. One of the great ironies of this, of an early critic, one of the great ironies um, Vera Britton writes in her book is that sometimes, sometimes, and in fact many times, a person who has attacked your work early on can over time, if they see you continuing doing the work, become your greatest supporter in public. In fact, you change their minds for them by continuing on. And that is something people don't realise in the heat of the moment. And it's why you should mind your manners, as they say, in public. I would also say, if you're coaching or if you're involved in any kind of team building, I would say, as you saw from the evidence of what I read earlier, cultivate your local historian. Always be friends with your local historian. Now, the local historian can become an unbelievable pest um, and can constantly be correcting your own memory of things that happened and things like this. But I would say that it's just part of the excitement they feel in your achievement and in the achievement of the team. You know, they'll say, do, do you know the Pat Lou? They will start, they'll start telling you about the backgrounds of your team and whose grandfather played for so-and-so and whose grandmother was on the Camogie team here. And like, that's all part of a great kind of paradigm of fame that they're creating for your team. And I'd let them off. I'd let them at it. So I would encourage always and cultivate local historians and give them some time. In arising from that, I would say always encourage a myth around your team. And that's really, as Aristotle said, as I said to you earlier, arranging some superlative incidents and remembering some superb names. And not just remembering some superb names, but repeating over and over again those successful older names and what they did and how they did it. And I always feel as young men or young women break out of the dressing room into to, to play, to hear the name of just one of those, of the names you've been constantly mentioning, is a really important mental armour for them because they'll go away out from your sight with the name of that one person. So repeat the names of the famous of the club or the famous of the county and dovetail that, I think, as well around a myth of your own team. Fourthly and finally, I would say, do not expect those you train to be athletes 24-7. Nobody should expect that of the young. And I mean that from a mental point of view rather than a physical point of view. They need to have a full life of their own. And they need to be trained to expect themselves to have moments of pure genius. It's something by storytelling, by myth-making, by anecdotes, by local history, that you teach them that somewhere in themselves are moments of pure genius and you're waiting to see them. That's really important, I think. But at the same time, you don't expect that life of genius to show itself every day of the week. So these are just the things I think about 
when I think of poetry and I think of my own kind of teaching of poetry down the years in workshops and various, with, and meeting young poets and seeing them go on. It's just a most fantastic thing um, to see them arrive at a point where they have a full book ready and it'll be published and it'll go out into the world announcing who they are and to have been there at the beginning of their work when they were either nervous or obnoxious, because some people can be obnoxious when they start, as well as being nervous. I think that's part of the joys, really, of teaching and of coaching. So my one word would be never get involved in a public spat. Thank you very much.